This episode, we've got our first RPG in a while, and a whole slew of footy games. And the Copa Americana isn't even until next year. Ah oh, well, let's get started. Our cover game this issue is Super Street Fighter 2, with new character Thunderhawk on the cover. In the letters column, we request for more RPG coverage, and they bring up... And they, I mean the editorial staff, brings up the expanded coverage of Secret of Mana, but we've also got the coverage of Breath of Fire this issue to go with it, in terms of satisfying the desires of the readers. We start off our game coverage this issue with our cover game, Super Street Fighter 2. The article gets into some of the new gameplay modes, including a tournament mode, though it's only a single elimination, so it's not quite Evo in a box. There are also some notes on the tweaks to the scoring system to improve and promote skillful play, like adding points for additional points for first hits, reversals, and for combos based on their length. There are also some tweaks to the character animations, and oh, oh yeah, um, four new characters. DJ, Thunderhawk, Kami, and Fei Long. Well, two of those end up becoming fixtures of the series. The other two end up getting eventually reintroduced later on. Super Street Fighter 2 isn't quite as fast as Turbo, but it feels like it's a little faster than Championship, uh, Championship Edition and World Warrior. I'm still missing a few of the features that would become fixtures of later titles in the series, like Super Meters and Harry's and Chip Damage. However, I think it makes it for a nice balance between the two earlier titles. It's more methodical, but it doesn't feel sluggish. New characters generally feel like a nice addition, with each generally being mechanically distinct from the main cast. There are also some balance tweaks, but ultimately, I think the new characters are what really makes this game stand out. Next up is Breath of Fire, our first more traditional JRPG in a while. This game was developed by Capcom and published by them in Japan, however, the US release is published by Square, presumably because they have more brand recognition for RPGs of this variety. We also have a rundown of the party members in the game and some of the environmental puzzle mechanics along with the world map. We also have some notes to guide you through the early game, but no maps. Breath of Fire is a very dramatic RPG for the Super Nintendo, with a dark and serious opening on par with the opening beats of Final Fantasy IV, but with a more distinct visual style. The controls are nice, and I appreciate the fact that the game allows for a level of customization to its key bindings above and beyond that of other Super Nintendo RPGs. That said, it's also pretty hard to get a hold of, particularly compared to the version for the Game Boy Advance. Additionally, the Game Boy Advance version has a dash button, which allows you to navigate some areas of the game more quickly, along with redone graphics and a quick save function that allows you to... well, quick save if you find yourself needing to stop playing before you reach a proper save point. I kind of prefer that version over the Super Nintendo version, but we'll see the Game Boy Advance version in later issues of Nintendo Power. Nintendo has a new advertising initiative, the Play It Loud campaign. We have screenshots of various games being covered in this campaign, and several pages in the general style, with stuff like Donkey Kong Country and others getting teased here. But not much information on if this means there are going to be changes to Nintendo Power. Considering how deliberately disjointed the presentation is here, God, I hope not. Next up is The Jungle Book from Virgin Interactive for the Super Nintendo. The article here gives notes on the very fluid animation from Mowgli, along with the different methods of traversal, and along with maps of the first six levels of the game. This issue has an article on the Game Boy version as well, but I'll cover that when I get to it. The Jungle Book is indeed a very fluidly animated game. It's, however, it's not a game with without issues with the platform. Navigating the environments relies a bunch on climbing and swinging on vines. The catch is that getting Mowgli to actually grab onto those vines is somewhat tricky. For vertical vines, you have to press the up button at the right time to grab them, and horizontal vines, well, Mowgli grabs them automatically. However, I can't tell with moving vines if I need to press up or not which makes using them very frustrating. This is actually kind of a bummer, because the game looks interesting and it could be fun, but the controls aren't quite there. We have lots of soccer games this issue, including EA's FIFA International Soccer. Most of the coverage of these is pretty generic, but a couple games are called off, called out for poor controls and interfaces. World Cup USA 94 from US Gold is called out for having good play control, paired with a bad interface, and Pele from Acolyn is called out for sluggish controls and animation. I've done further digging on this, and 
Paleo for the Super Nintendo never even got a release, only a Genesis version. So apparently it was incomplete enough that Accolade canned it, and a prototype has yet to be leaked. So this is the part where I put a link in the show notes to the Video Game History Foundation. If you have a prototype of this game or any documentation on its development, please consider getting in touch with Steve Lynn and the VGHF and see about donating. World Cup 94 is clearly a soccer game that's designed to move very quickly and play very smoothly, and it does. I didn't have much of a problem with passing, shooting, or even going after other opponents. Controls were smooth, and while I didn't get on the level of precision that I want with goal kicks, which is having a designated shoot button on offense and a directional button designating where in the goal you're trying to put the ball, I was able to do what I wanted to do in the game. Considering how fast the game moves and the different lengths that you can assign the halves was a nice touch, and I also appreciate that the game incorporates stoppage time. FIFA International Soccer aims to be a more accurate simulation of soccer rather than something more arcadey, like World Cup 94. This also means it has something of a steeper learning curve than World Cup 94 does, and the control setup, in a way, loses something when it comes to customization. It's still a fun game, but it's definitely something where I know going in that even playing with a good team, I'm likely to end up losing a lot of matches before I feel I could consistently win against the computer. Never mind against the people. Capcom Soccer Shootout is a bit like a NES-era soccer game scaled up for the Super Nintendo. When you're on defense, you basically move all your characters at once instead of controlling just one defender with the AI controlling the rest of the team. But when you're on offense, the other players move independently so you can work the pass to open players. But this means that when you're on defense, you're really on your own, which makes things kind of rough on that front. Also, the game tends to run into some slowdown when you get a whole bunch of players on screen at once, it's still a fun game, but somewhat inferior to World Cup 94. Championship Soccer 94 might be better known to European viewers, particularly for ones from the UK, as Sensible Soccer 94. Having finally had the chance to play a sensible soccer game, I now completely understand the appeal. The controls are simple, intuitive, and precise, and the AI for your players works with what you're trying to do. Your teammates will move to get to your pass, and rather than just passing the ball in a general direction, when you pass, it's clear that the ball is always intended to get to another player. It might not always get there, and certainly if you're passing into coverage, there is a chance that the pass will be intercepted. But it, but should that happen, it feels like that pass is being intercepted because you passed into coverage, not because the controls weren't precise enough and you just passed in a random direction, or your player got out of the way of the pass instead of trying to get to the ball, that sort of thing. Kickoff 3, European Challenge, never actually received a US release. But we do have ROM dumps of the game, so I was able to take a look at those. Though they are from a beta release that feels very incomplete, particularly when it comes to the whole interface in general. It seems to use some sort of basic mouse interface, which obviously doesn't work well if you're not using the Super Nintendo mouse. This also kind of makes sense with support from a uh, PC release as well. Elite Soccer, much like World Cup 94, moves incredibly fast and controls almost, but not quite, as well. I felt like I had the same degree of control as World Cup 94, except with shooting. Actually, the shooting feels more precise, but they're not perfect. I can't direct the ball game to shoot to a particular point on the goal, and I had a bit of frustration when it came to certain degrees of passing. But otherwise, in a way, it feels a little better. The interface is also a bit of a mess, but otherwise it's fine. In fact, actually, I felt like I enjoyed Elite Soccer a little more than World Cup 94, though not as much as Championship Soccer 94, which I consider the best of the footy games that have been covered this issue. Moving out of the sports titles, we have Liberty or Death from Koei, a strategy game based on the American Revolutionary War. The article gives info on controlling the big picture, along with some of the generals on either side. I think Liberty or Death is probably the best gateway to Koei's strategy games of this era, because all things considered, you have a lot less variables to manage. You're managing the stats of your units, your officers, and the populace, all of which are pretty clear and cut. I mean, you still have to keep track of supply your troops with food and ammunition and that sort of thing, but you're not managing food production in the way that you are in 
Romance of the Three Kingdoms and Dumbnag's Ambition, nor are your tactics in battle quite as elaborate. Further, you've only got two factions, the United States and the British Empire, no elaborate political maneuvering with marriages and that sort of thing between independent states and governors and that sort of thing. You're not fighting a freewheeling battle royale like with Koei's tentpole strategy franchises. Additionally, for US audiences, the material covered here, much as with Pacific Theater of Operations and Operation Europe, is material that audiences of pretty much age, any age bracket would have some degree of familiarity with. That said, it's still a game that benefits from having the manual, but it's not a requirement, the same way that it would be with Romance of the Three Kingdoms and Nobunaga's Ambition. Next is the Super Nintendo version of Tetris 2. I have previously covered every version of this game. NES, Game Boy, just this one remains uncovered. And the main new addition to this one is the puzzle mode, so I'm going to focus on that. The puzzle mode of Tetris 2 is interestingly designed. It's clear that it's meant to introduce various gameplay mechanics for this version of Tetris to the player, but it's not great at communicating that, particularly when it comes to ideas like a piece left free-falling after another chunk has landed in the T-spot. Still, it gives the opportunity to learn these concepts in puzzle mode, as opposed to the other releases of the game. The final installment of the Double Dragon series on the Super Nintendo is a tie-in to the animated TV series, and instead of a brawler, fighting game. The article gives some notes on the roster. One. Double Dragon 5 is kind of a dumb mess, mainly due to the AI and the lack of responsiveness when it comes to doing special moves. On the AI side, the AI seems to have lightning reflexes when it comes to blocking special attacks, meaning that if you don't manage to land an attack in the middle of some of the, anim of the very quick animations, the AI will be able to successfully block. On the special move side of things, actually pulling off the special moves for the characters requires a level of responsiveness and reflex that I was never able to full off, pull off. It's not like the moves are particularly arcane or obtuse. Indeed, a lot of the moves are variant of Street Fighter moves. For example, the Lee brothers use quarter circle back punch for one of their attacks and a sonic boom motion for another. Where things fall into problems is the input window to do those moves. I was never able to get my inputs into that window. It feels like the game designers failed to do some analysis of the size of the input window for Street Fighter 2's moves and decided to make it a very tight window to make the moves special, but without cutting down how often the AI would use those moves. Now it's a poorly put together fighting game without any of the real visual style that something like Play Fighter had. We have a publisher profile here with Williams, so in this case it's covering them not as a console game publisher, but as an arcade game publisher, both in the context of them publishing games that were big hits on the Super Nintendo, like NBA Jam and Mortal Kombat, and also in the context of Nintendo's upcoming partnership with them on Cruisin' USA and Killer Instinct. We have the start of their full Secret of Mana walkthrough. As I've already reviewed that game, I'm not going to re-review it here. In classified information, we have a 299 bullet code for Wolfenstein 3D. And in Counselor's Corner, we have some more questions about Final Fantasy Legend. We have an art showcase this issue with border art submissions for the Super Game Boy, which is neat, but you have to redo them yourself each time, so it's kind of a little rough on that front. Or at least you can't share them yourself, as far as you need to take pictures of them, but you can't export them to somebody else's system, which is also kind of a bummer. Anywho, moving into Game Boy titles, we have Tarzan, based on the Edgar Wright Burroughs character, but not tied into any particular version of the character. However, as with the Super Nintendo version of Pele, I can't actually find any releases of this particular game. I can find copies of the Game Boy Color game based on the Disney movie, but no luck finding this one. So again, if you have a prototype cop for a copy of this game, please contact Steve Lynn, Frank Cifaldi, and the Video Game History Foundation because... In a museum. And here we have the coverage of the Game Boy port of the Jungle Book. We have notes, but not maps for all six levels. So, on the good side, Jungle Book is really good about balancing the size of the character's sprites with the camera perspective, and the game has some very large levels for the Game Boy. But on the minus side, they're a little too large, with some problems with the placement of the checkpoints. In particular, the size of levels and the multiple paths through the levels it becomes too easy to miss a checkpoint and have to start the whole thing over from the beginning, particularly if you're going on an alternate route. 
especially an alternate route you can easily stumble onto and which is not necessarily too difficult. By comparison, with the original Super Mario Bros., once you pass a certain point in the level, you just triggered a checkpoint no matter how you passed it, even if you took an alternate route to the pipe. And in Super Mario World, the different routes to the level had their own checkpoints on them to accommodate the player's actions. You could jump over or avoid the checkpoint, but they were still there. This game does neither, which is pretty poor level design. Speaking of ports, we have a Game Boy port of Space Invaders. Not much to say here when it comes to gameplay mechanics. This is the archetypal, prototypal origin point of all shooters. What makes the Game Boy version of Space Invaders notable isn't that it's a solid force of Space Invaders, though it is, but what it does when you pop it in the Super Game Boy. Put it in the Super Game Boy and you basically get a whole bunch of new functionality at the game, including a uh, simulation of playing the game with colored cellophane over a black and white screen, and oh yeah, there is a Super Nintendo enhanced version of the game that takes advantage of the full size of the screen with a variety of backgrounds. I will admit here that I am absolutely terrible at space and view, particularly when it comes to getting the last few aliens, and that Galaxian and Galaga and Xevious are more jam. Wrapping up the Game Boy coverage, we have Jeopardy Sports Edition. I normally don't talk about trivia games because they tend to be very poorly, and trivia sports games even more so. So I'm not really going to feature this one. As an example for how badly this ages, though, the article gives a selection of sample questions that are in the game, and one of them is, this catcher has won the most golden gloves with Johnny Bench as the answer. Or rather, who is Johnny Bench? Question. Jeopardy. It's weird. Except now, now in 2018, the answer to that question is Ivan Rodriguez. Which means, in order to get this question right, you would have to know that the answer had changed and when it changed. So... I know we don't cover each issue's contest, but this one is worth calling attention to. The big prize for this issue is a trip to the 1994 World Series, which didn't happen due to a player's strike. We'll see if they say what the winner gets instead in a future issue. In the top 20, Street Fighter 2 has managed to split the votes of its fans with Turbo at number 6 and Super at number 20. Otherwise, not much of a ship across the board. In the now playing column, the also rounds include Operation Europe, The Path to Victory from Koei, which I briefly discussed earlier, and Freeway Flyboys from Seika. You know, remember when Koei was the company that was known for the console equivalents of Hearts of Iron and Europa Universalis and Crusader Kings, or, or at least stuff like the Total War series, with multiple countries and time periods covered by their games, instead of being the company that's known for Dynasty Warriors? Good times. In comics, we have the, or other pack watch games, we have the video game and comic tie-in, Spider-Man and Venom, Maximum Carnage. We also have the adventure game, Pac-Man 2, and again, then calling back to the Koei strategy games, we have Aerobiz, Super Sonic. Breath of the Fire is a fantastic JRPG and absolutely worth your time in whatever version you can get a hold of, whether Super Nintendo or Game Boy Advance. But of the specific releases covered in this issue, if you don't have a copy of Space Invaders for the Game Boy already, you should really pick a copy of that game up. Especially if you have a Super Nintendo and a Super Game Boy. Thank you very much for watching. If you enjoyed the show, please like and subscribe, and also consider backing my Patreon. Patreon backers get episodes up to one week early of this show and any f future Let's Plays. Also, please consider backing my coffee. Uh, toss me a few bucks, also helps support the show, and it's not a monthly obligation or anything like that.